to begin with. Um, and I encourage you to start interpreting uh, from my next sentence or wherever, you know, so that you get into the mood. So it's like warming up, a warming up exercise before actually starting to interpret um, or, you know, before I start my speech, which I've prepared for you for tonight. But, I'd, uh, you know, I thought uh, I'd say a couple of couple more words about my own background during this warm up warm up speech um, and like i said i'm finnish i'm um, i'm from finland and uh, i trained a long time ago at university and uh, back in those days uh, all the teachers always told us you know there's you know well, you can be interested in interpreting but you know, you'll never make a living as an interpreter and um, I remember that was a bit discouraging at the time. Um, but um, after the first intro introductory courses, I always felt that was my thing. That's what I liked best. I liked it much more than, than uh, translation, although the, uh, uh, the degree was a dual degree in translation and interpreting. Um, and... Uh, it was just so amazing then when Finland joined the EU in 1995 that all of a sudden it was possible for people with Finnish mother tongue to work as full-time interpreters in the EU. I was one of the people who got um, recruited at that stage and uh, the rest is history. I'm still here and um, um, I'd also like to say, you know, don't be intimidated, although I did mention my my official language is you're still young. I started out with just uh, English and Finnish. I worked in and out of Finnish, between Finnish and English. Uh, so uh, the rest of these languages I've added as I've gone along. And uh, there is a big, big difference uh, between the private market and the institutional market because and, and this is what I hear is true even to the Belgian and other private markets which are to a great extent biactive. So you can't add a lot of languages because you would always have to work in and out of uh, that language, uh, between that language and your mother tongue. And quite frankly there's no private market for uh, Finnish into Portuguese. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> so those languages that I've actually added in the course of my career um, with a lot of help from my employer. Um, and it is a, a, a fantastic job, so I do encourage you to continue with your efforts. Now, um, uh, before going into my actual topic, uh, this is another thing that we at least always, uh, in, in the EU we tend to do, is uh, we introduce the topic and give any difficult words, because the intention uh, is not to, to make any stumbling blocks uh, because, of, because I'd use some funny words or, 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 or names or something, um, although of course that's what we get every day at work. <laughs> <laughs> horrible pronunciation, unclear names, sometimes you don't even know whether it's a name or not. Uh, uh, one particularly uh, difficult is if there is a person called Franz in a meeting and then you don't know whether, you know, the chairman says Franz and you don't know whether it's Franz the country or Franz the person. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so uh, the names, there's, there's one name or, or one expression uh, is called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, uh, spelled S-A-P-I-R hyphen W-H-O-R-F. I repeat that, S-A-P-I-R. That's almost my, an anagram of my name, actually. It is <laughs> my first name. And Whorf, W-H-O-R-F. Um, and it's uh, the sapir whorf hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Navajo uh, and Apache, but those presumably you know in your own languages. Um, and then um, 
I'll mention the Max Planck Institute, uh, which is in uh, in a place called I'm not sure about the pronunciation, but I will say more or less like Nijmegen, um, N I J N E G E N, in the ne Netherlands. Yes, I can see that <laughs> the Dutch speakers are laughing at my pronunciation. <laughs> Feel free. Um, anyway, so I think um, I think that's about it uh, for in way of um, in way of warm ups. Are you ready? I think you are. Okay, so let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to be addressing you here tonight, and my topic is a particularly fascinating one. Uh, it, uh, because I'm going to talk to you about language and thought. No one would disagree uh, with the claim that language and thought interact in a number of significant ways. However, there is great disagreement about the proposition that um, each uh, language has its own way of influencing thought and action of people who speak that language. I'll give you an example of Finnish. We jokingly sometimes say of Finnish, which is my mother tongue, by the way, is that uh, Finnish has no sex and therefore no future. Uh, what does this mean? Um, it means that Finnish has no grammatical gender. Words are not divided into masculine and feminine, and uh, also the third person doesn't have a separate masculine or feminine form. So I can say, last night I went out with my friend, da da da, they said, <clears throat> as in the person's gender doesn't, uh, isn't revealed by uh, the third person pronoun that I use. Um, <clears throat> and there is no specific future tense either. Um, I just say, I do it tomorrow, I go there next year. Um, so it doesn't mean that we have no way of indicating the future, of course. Any language has that and needs that, but we do not have a specific grammatical form for that. Uh, now, some people say then that the fact that we don't have masculine and feminine means we can't uh, distinguish be between men and women, but I do assure you that we can and we do. <clears throat> then, uh, of course, there is uh, the fact that anybody who has learned more than one language will uh, will be struck by how much uh, or, or by how many ways there are in which languages differ from one another. Then again, uh, we somehow, on some level, tend to expect people to experience the world in similar ways, irrespective of their mother tongue and where they grew up in. Uh, then, of course, um, uh, research workers uh, compare languages, and when such comparisons are made, um, one possibility is to pay attention to what are known as universals, uh, that means uh, looking in at the ways in which all languages are similar. And the other way of uh, doing things is looking at particulars, uh, which means uh, looking um, or, or carrying out research into the ways in which each individual language or, or type of language is special or even unique. Um, there are many linguists um, and uh, other uh, scientists, social scientists mostly, who are interested in universals, and uh, some of them have formulated theories who, that, that, that aim to describe the human language 
and explain uh, language, uh, human language and human language behavior um, in general terms, um, meaning that uh, it is something that is speci specific to the human species. However, uh, the idea that different languages um, would influence thinking in different ways has been present in many cultures and a lot of papers have been written on this topic. It is nonetheless extremely difficult to try to pin down the effects of a particular language on a particular thought pattern, um, i.e. how a given language influences the way people think. Um, and therefore, the question remains ra largely unresolved. Uh, this idea comes, and comes in fashion um, and goes out of fashion, and people have spent considerable energy in efforts to either support or refute this, uh, uh, this hypothesis. Um, in this arena, there are two problems that we need to confront. They are known as linguistic relativity, and the second one is linguistic determinism. Now, linguistic relativity is easy to demonstrate, because uh, if you want to speak any language, you have to pay attention to the meanings that are grammatically marked in that language. For instance, I'm speaking English now, and in English you need to mark the verb, uh, and marking the verb indicates the time a certain occurrence took place. Uh, for instance, you say, it's raining, or it's rained, and so forth. There are languages that work in completely different ways, because in Turkish, for instance, it's impossible to simply say, it rained last night. You just can't do it. Turkish hasn't a way of saying that. Because in Turkish, there are uh, two, different, uh, uh, two different past tenses, or more, more than one past tense, actually. And uh, this is something that quite a few American Indian languages have as, as, as well. And the choice of the correct past tense depends on, um, on how you learned uh, about that event. How, it, how, how come you know it rained last night? Um, because in Turkish, uh, one of these uh, past tenses is used to report direct experience, that means something you witnessed personally, you saw it happen, um, and the other is used to report events that you only know about inference or hearsay. Therefore, if you were out in the rain last night, then you will say um, it rained last night, and you will do this by using a particular past tense form, which indicates that you were a witness to the rain. But if you wake up in the morning and you just see that the streets are wet um, and, and the garden is wet, uh, then you will have to resort to using a different form of past tense, the one that indicates that you didn't see the rain. Now, differences like this are fascinating, and they have fascinated linguists and anthropologists for centuries. There are hundreds of facts that have been reported about such exotic languages, um, like verbs that are marked or chosen uh, to, to, according to a shape of an object, uh, that you're handling, and this is the case uh, with Navajo. 
uh, and uh, and also Korean makes distinctions um, according to the relative ages uh, between the speaker and the hearer, for for instance. Um, and uh, such facts are really fascinating to compare, and they, of course, uh, are considered by some to be proof of uh, how language um, uh, how how language influences your thought. Um, but you, you, such interesting phenomena occur not only in in exotic languages. Uh, because there are some um, interesting features about uh, English, for instance. Because um, in English you can you, you it, it, well, in English you can say George Bush has worked in Washington, but you cannot say Richard Nixon has worked in Washington. Now I don't know if you're too young to remember Richard Nixon, but uh, the obvious reason to this is. Um, that Richard Nixon is dead, and uh, you cannot use this particular past tense that I just used um, uh, to assertions concerning people who are not alive. And this is something, you know, it is a particularity about the English language that, for instance, I had never um, thought about. And it is rather exotic. Um, I'll just... Uh, Turn to our um, moderator. Okay, so I still have some time. To, uh, I, I don't I, just if I if I ramble on for too long, just let me know and I'll I'll wind up. Um, uh, then apparently we have some more time, so I'll just uh, I'll just continue. Um, then, um, as you may remember, um, because so far I've been talking more about linguistic relativism. And uh, now I'll move on to uh, saying a few words about linguistic determinism and uh, people who uh, think that that is more important. Uh, uh, what does that mean, uh, that somebody is a proponent of linguistic determinism? It means uh, that uh, they think that differences between languages actually influence the ways in which people think. And perhaps language even shapes uh, the, the, the way in which uh, the cultures uh, of these language communities are organized. And uh, one of the strongest statements of, uh, uh, to prove this point of view um, is uh, the, so, uh, the so-called superior fourth hypothesis uh, which was, uh, surprise, surprise, um, uh, uh, presented by uh, Mr. Sapir and Mr. Worf. Um, uh, they said um, that we tend to cut nature up and organize it into concepts. And then we ascribe significances into these things, largely because we are parties to an agreement to organize things in this way. And this agreement, uh, this agreement is uh, accepted by all the speakers of a given language community and it is codified in the patterns of that language. Uh, and another way of describing this um, is by the other uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Sapir, who says um, something like this, that human beings are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. The fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent built up on the language habits of the group. And this, uh, cause this t takes place to a great extent uh, without the people even being aware of this. Now, these are extremely bold claims. And the obvious question we need to ask is, how can such bold claims uh, be substantiated? Uh, uh, 
if we want to do something other than just look at individual languages. Now, um, if we take this hypothesis seriously, it should be possible to show that Turks are more sensitive to, Amer uh, to, to evidence than Americans, but that Americans or English speakers are more aware of death than Turks, or that Finns um, are less conscious of people being men and women than speakers of other languages. Um, but uh, I will not be able to uh, go into this uh, topic more in, in greater detail because I've been told that my time is up. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm uh, available for questions if you've got any questions for me. Thank you.